All right, listen to this while we were coming out of commercial. 227 yards. Colt Nost. Hole in one, we haven't had one since James Lee. burning rays wearing down his body. The diesel's worth the price of gold. It's the cheapest grain he's ever sold. All righty, folks, welcome back to episode number 33. Your boy Jay Swish, right off the tips of the coach just had a hockey night in scottsdale we recorded a little bit of that game we did the whole game we did a live stream a tuesday night tilt featuring the washington capitals and the detroit red wings my god azo that game so boring it's like watching fucking paint dry i mean the capitals just kind of lured the red wings to sleep and they ended up winning that game ov tucked the late one in the second period and, and kind of put the nail in the coffin in the third period was just more or less the same it was it wasn't perfect, my friend. That game, I mean, watching the Capitals play, just I don't know how this team's going to make the playoffs. I mean, even watching Detroit play, like Ovi and that team, they they won that it's game, crazy. Ozzie, but they're so goddamn slow. Like when they play their first round matchup of whoever they get, if it's the Rangers, if it's Carolina, like they're going to get whacked for Cobb. I, they're not going to win a game. That team is the slowest team I've ever seen play. We've watched them back to back weeks now in terms of on Hockey Night in Scottsdale. It's like, holy fuck. I mean, how are they going to make the playoffs? Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, it's just, it's just, I, I don't know. So I don't, that I don't game understand it either. Like, Jordo, I've watched them every game. I've watched them. I can't believe they have a winning record. They look terrible. Oh, they, it's horrible. Like, I mean, I'm not saying I'm a, a big Washington Capitals fan, or I watch them a lot. But the last two weeks, I've watched them, and for a team eyeing down a playoff spot, I'm like. Holy shit. It's just, it's so boring. They're so slow. Detroit obviously plays that 1 3 1 style. Derek Lalone, Newsy Lalone, who coached me in Green Bay, plays that similar style of neutral zone to his boy, John Cooper, who he coached years with in Tampa Bay. So they kind of sit back as is. But Washington, not the fleetest of foot team. I mean, they're not dicing it up out there. They're kind of clunking around. Dylan Strom was able to get one in the second. And then Ovi late in the dying seconds gets that game to two Cobb. And then it was pretty much over. But before we get to any other hockey talk and NHL talk, as we always do over here at Live and Five, we plug our YouTube page. Folks, please go check out our YouTube page. That is at Live and Five 2024. Again, every like, every subscription. All you tuning into our shorts on there, everything you can find on our social media pages is all on the YouTube page. So please go over to at Live and Five 2024. This is episode number 33, the Larry Bird special. Talk about a white boy that just made hooping cool again. The pride of French Lick, Indiana, played his college ball at Indiana State. Obviously made his way to the association to the Boston Celtics, but Larry Bird. One of my all-time favorites, another number 33 of my all-time favorites. Speaking of the man, the myth, the legend himself, the godfather. Folks that don't know, that is Clark Saunders. Clark Dale Saunders, good friend of ours, a golf trip guy, North Dakota goalie, came over from Alabama Huntsville back when that, well, that program almost folded like a wee fest tent back in the day. He came over to UND. He transferred. Man, was he awesome. Fit right in, got a suit tattoo right on his heart like the second day he got there. I mean, just talk about a guy that was bleeding green, even down south in a nice state of Alabama, but came north, joined the boys. So shout out to Dale, a true friend of the show. Folks, as always, we're brought to you by Butter Golf and Mini Movers. Butter Golf, the official lifestyle and apparel brand over here at Live and Five. Mini Movers. The official moving company of Live and Five. Speaking of a guy you moved, Azo just tucked his 40th goal of the season, Brock Besser, up in Vancouver. So shout out to Bess, shout out to Mini Movers, and shout out to Butter Golf. Azo, before we get going into the greatest week, arguably in all of sports, over in Augusta, I see you putting your mid on right now, my friend. God, does it feel good going into the iconic week of the Masters, a week you sit on the couch the whole goddamn time. You watch the Masters. The coverage is unbelievable. Their app is so good. Before we get to that and before we get to our awesome interview today with Colton Nost, who will be boots on the ground at Augusta calling 
the entire tournament for CBS alongside the great Jim Nance. Those two guys are probably the best in golf right now as far as I'm concerned. So Nosti was awesome. He stopped by to talk to us for about 45 minutes regarding everything Masters. Unbelievable, dude. So fired up for that conversation. We're fucking hot on the interviews lately, but that is long-winded. Azo, what's up, man? How you doing? How's the weekend snap? Let's get to that first. What's shaking, baby? How you doing? You had a late day in the office today. Man, you're a fucking grinder. You put the work boots on from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m., and then you get right on the airways with your boy Swish. We talk it out, but how you doing, man? What's up on a Tuesday? Doing well, man. It's uh, it's always fun being on here. You know, this is easy. You get to sit down. I got a nice, comfortable chair. I'm sitting back, just talking with my buddy. Um, but yeah, the weekend was good. Jordan actually went and saw Cat Williams at the uh, the old Target Center. And no way, Kat, you got to see yeah, Kat? dude. He's one of my favorites. Cat's a legend, man. He's a legend. But boy, how was that? He, he brings a dark crowd. I mean, I think I was like me, one of maybe 30, you know, Caucasians in there, but God damn right. I was laughing. Mo most of the time he was making fun of me. So it was kind of funny. Like everyone's looking at us, like laughing at us. And I was like, this is funny. This is great. You know, he's making fun of white people, but it was great. It was awesome, man. It was, it's always great to see a legend. I mean, cats, where's cat rank, man. He's, he's up there. Like he's an all timer. Yeah, he's unbelievable. I mean, I mean, just remember back in the day, like my back to my junior days, and a guy you know, Caleb Herbert, who played at the University of Minnesota Duluth. He was a roommate of mine in Sioux City, and we'd always put on that Cat Williams bit late at night after crushing a couple four locos down in the basement, and we put on that every day I'm hustling bit. And still to this day, that is one of the mm -hmm. best bits of all time when he's talking about he's in the grocery store. He's like, you know, you ain't got the four ninety nine to buy that motherfucker, but you in there every day I'm hustling. He's like doing a dance. <laughs> yeah. It's the clip is all time. The whole bit is amazing. But what was his current bit on? You mentioned he was making fun of white boys. Was there anything else funny? Was he shooting off about Hollywood, how he kind of did in that sit down yeah. with Shannon Sharp? Or was it mostly just making fun of, you know, the, the, the old white folk over here? Come on, baby. Uh, you know, you're their support. Let's go. We we want to we want of all. It was it was great. He uh, it, was, it was a lot of, you know, making fun of white people doing dumb stuff. I wish I could remember. Um, exactly what he said. I can't, but yeah, he definitely went into the Hollywood thing. Um, and he called all that shit. He called Diddy on, on Sh club Shay Shay with Shannon Sharp. So yeah. yeah, I mean, it was, it was awesome. Like he, I think he had like fucking five or six openers. Um, some of them were pretty funny. Some of them I didn't really listen to just kind of talked. Um, we actually had, a, I was sitting in a suite. So I, you know, Whenever you're in a suite, you kind of just you go back and forth from conversation in the back, maybe around the island table, um, to actually watching the show. So uh, it was it was great though. And then obviously we went out and had a nightcap after, and um, kind of got after it. But then Saturday, Jordo, Saturday, crazy. I, I had to go put up this. I had to go. I agreed to go put up this guy's jungle gym in his backyard. And oh god, he's got this old jungle gym. That he brings out. I mean, it was bigger than my fucking elementary school jungle gym. It was insane. I, I can't agree. I can't believe I agreed to it. But anyways, you know, I I'm, I find myself digging holes. I got a, I got a big blister on my hand. If you can see that, I, I got a blister from you know going oh, zero oh, mode yeah. on holes. Digging up up holes. I was gonna say you went full Hector Zeroni. <laughs> yes, there it is. There it is. Um, but yeah, I did that for about eight hours on Saturday. Hung to the gills. But God damn yeah. it, I was no longer hung after the day. Felt great no, after. You that you know, out. Oh, just done. Out in the out in the open, you know, sunshine, clean air. Um, yeah, it was fine. You know, you're just a bunch of guys grabbing tools and getting to work. But God damn it, it went way longer than I thought it was going to go. Yeah, a project like that is always not perfect. But did you have a set of mitts on? I know you got your glove mitt on right now, but did you have a pair of Franklins when you were doing that? Or were you bare knuckling it, bare backing it, and not having any protection on those hands? Because a job like that, my friend, you need a little something between the skin and the you know laying down that lumber. Yeah, no, I, I made a huge mistake. I didn't think I'd be digging holes. I honestly went over there thinking I'd be twisting wrenches, maybe holding up some wood. Um, but I found myself shovel in hand, fucking digging trenches. There's nothing worse in the world, Jordo, than digging holes. I mean, it's terrible. It's, it's, no. it destroys your back, your hands, your wrists. I mean, it is awful. I can't believe this guy made me dig a hole in his yard. It's, it's, it's insane. You know, shout out to, you know, my uncle Mark, right? The nerd, you know, he's just an absolute yeah. buzzsaw, absolute beauty. You know him very well, Azo. And we got to give nerd a shout out on this show right now, because this guy back in his day, 
and he could still probably fucking do it, but he was he would install sprinkler systems at an alarming rate. So he learned of this trick of the trade when he was doing it in college. He was working with a local guy actually in Grand Forks, one of his good buddies who ran a company doing sprinklers in the summer I think different odd jobs as well. But nerd, like I just remember vividly remember him in every house we moved into it when we were younger, whether it was their house or, you know, our folks and our family moved a couple of times, the sprinkler system would always be put in. And you know that job very well too, just seeing guys do it in and around homes. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're digging a bunch of holes, you're gutting it out. And this guy, would be absolutely buzzing there'd be mud all over his face he'd have blisters all the way up to his elbows i mean he'd be yeah. fucking red all over dirt everywhere there'd be shit all over the place but god yeah. damn it he'd get that job done at the pace i've never seen anyone play it and if you know how he talks and you know how much hard he buzzes can't you just picture him just absolutely I was just gonna buzzing, say, putting in the sprinkler system <laughs> i was just gonna say that just knowing him that is the least surprising thing i've ever heard i mean that is just like to a T like that does not surprise me one bit. And I wish I had game film of it. I would fucking watch that. Oh man. And I, I still can just picture it like it was yesterday. I mean, he'd be direct in traffic. He'd usually have like my uncle Monty out there. My dad would be inside doing nothing because he's too smart to even go out there and just try to get in the way. Like he's not going to be doing that job. So he's just like sitting inside. He puts his best man on it. As they say in Caddyshack, Carl Spackler. And he goes out there and just starts having an absolute field day. And he, God damn it. He'd have that thing installed. He'd have all the buttons and everything ready, connected through the electrical system into the box, into the garage and like a day's work. I mean, this guy, Holy fuck what he buzz and he still buzzes. So shout out to the nerd, one of the best, an OG. So Azo, I feel your pain over there. That is just some good old fashioned blue collar work. My weekend over here, Azo, folks were in town. Kylie Schmaltz, legend of the game, came into the town. But you know who I got to see? Actually, we mentioned a little bit in that pre show uh, was Brock Besser, our good boy Best. Did you we had him on? How's he doing? Our- yeah, just just quickly after the game on Wednesday, he played against yeah. Nick. Uh, the Vancouver Canucks skated away with a win, but yeah, it was good to see Best. They were on their way to LA, but you know, just always good seeing one of your own, a golf trip guy, hang out with him for five ten minutes. You know what, the fella, he's looking skinny right now. He's looking lean, like he he's Is maybe he? like seven percent body fat. I've never seen him like this. Normally, you know, Best is carrying a little bit of the love handle. Man, yeah, he's he looks, a little bit on him. He looks good. Yeah, it's not, nice. nothing on him. Also, his, his jaw is chiseled, and he's looking really good. I mean, there's no reason. I mean, there's no secret why the guy's had his best year of his career. Like yeah. he, he looks in really good shape, man. About time he's fucking taking it seriously. Yeah, yeah, only year <laughs> seven, so that was cool. And then on Friday, also Nikki played in his 500th game, so the, the yeah, folks didn't nails. even know that. I, I, I had you know had wind of it or whatever, but my parents came in just just to see us and hang out. And they're like, oh, wow, it's Nick's 500th game. So after the game on Friday, that game they beat Vegas with six unanswered goals, we went over to Stake 44, a great little spot, probably the most National League spot in the desert, had a table of probably 15 guys, uh, family included, but you know, three to six, seven guys stopped over. It was pretty cool, just hanging out. Nick, they had a great game. He had a couple apples. Obviously, you know, the dogs have been out for a while, but anytime you can beat Vegas, especially rallying like that in the third sure. tier over at the iconic sure. Mullet Arena, it was cool, man. It was it was awesome to see and, you know, just the support he has from his teammates. Uh, you know, obviously he's a good dude, but uh, it's just cool what that means to to the whole family and, you know, to Nick. And here's the 500 more foul. Azo, but Sunday, my friend, I mean, were you not tuned in to the Caitlin Clark and the Gamecock show? This, to me was the first time I've ever really watched women's ball. I'm saying in the tournament wise, I watched probably, I mean, I'm not going to mm-hmm. lie. I probably watched a sweet 16 game, half of it. And then I watched the elite eight game. And then I watched the, you know, up into the final four, but man, what a game. I mean, for the first time ever, the women's final four outdrew the men's. It was 18.9 million versus like 14.6 million. And I was in that category. Like I only watched the women's yesterday. I find myself watching maybe five to 10 minutes of that men's game. I was watching hockey more so, but did you watch that game? And you just feel for a girl like Clarkie leaving her chin out there, leaving everything she had in the game, obviously going to go down as probably the best college women's basketball player of all time. For sure. But you got to touch on how good that South Carolina team is. Those girls are so athletic. I was fucking, it was wild. Dude, like I, I tip, How do you yeah. go 30? How do you go? What do they go? 38, 39 and oh, how do you do that? Yeah. How do you not lose a game? Like, how do you not? I don't know. I, know. I know. I know you can be that much better than everyone else, but how do you not just drop one? Like you show up, like oh, we don't really feel like playing this game. We're gonna play like shit. I don't know. That's impressive. But yeah, Caitlin Clark is an all-time great. 
Did you see Jordo? She's uh, I did watch that game. I wanted her to win so bad, but you're not going to beat that South Carolina team. Did you see Jordo? They're already selling tickets in the WNBA for when they play the, the team who has um, the first overall pick. So Caitlin Clark, like they're already selling out tickets no, for Caitlin Clark no to way. come to town. The rookie. Yeah. Insane. They're, they're some of the, some of the women's teams are going to bigger stadiums for their first game when they play this team. Cause Caitlin Clark's coming to town. I mean, that's how big of a name she is. It's insane. It's so sick. And I, I mean, I'm a big Jersey guy as is like, I need to find me a Clarkie 22 car on Iowa, the Hawkeyes sure. or Jersey, or maybe even a WNBA Jersey because she was that nasty. And I mean, she was getting, she had the iron curtain on her, man. That was a Joseph Stalin like trap. I mean, she couldn't get away from anyone that you see that girl on South Carolina, the defender had her hand literally in her yeah. eyes the whole time. Like every time she was dribbling, you know, like when you're playing, on the pavement mm -hmm. at, out at recess or you're on the wood in a pickup game and the guy's just got a hand in your face. Like it literally makes you want to fight them. Like to the point where like, buddy, you better get that hand out of my face. I'm going to swat that away. I'm going to take a technical <laughs> Rashid Wallace style and punch you in the face. Or maybe I'll even go Auburn yes. Hill style metal world peace and fucking just start brawling right now because that is so goddamn annoying. And she was you, all over like white on rice. Yeah. You actually, when someone has it, you're right. Like I actually can't last more than probably 10 15 seconds with a hand in my face before i'm like all right buddy i'm fucking playing basketball in a fucking driveway like let's let up like right. are, you want to go like are we going right now like do we need to do this i'd be it's so annoying that's so funny oh it's the worst because it, yeah it's, <laughs> it's the worst it's, the whole game she was like that and you could just tell the just the athleticism versus the two teams i mean south carolina the way they can move the ball their big girls were unbelievable good feet iowa kind of clunky farmer girls mm -hmm. they relied a lot on their passing a lot on their cuts where you know south carolina was up and down the floor move the rock get up and down iowa was kind of like milk the shot clock try to find the perfect little play and or pass or cut so i just thought that game was great and you know what for a team like south carolina you got to give a shout out to this guy and i don't know if you're aware of this guy Azo. his name was gamecock jesus and actually my sister was telling me about him because he used to go to her volleyball games when they go play south carolina so this gamecock jesus this guy he was a super fan of over 50 years in south carolina you look him up online he legit looks like jesus i mean i'll, I'll pull up a couple pictures here for the folks right now but anyways gamecock jesus died in december i'm not sure from what but he had never missed a women's game or a men's game and i, I think close no. to 50 years like it, it was crazy so <laughs> it was cool that they won for him and just what a name. I mean, you're, you're talking mm -hmm. about Gamecock Jesus, like this guy, an absolute legend. You, you just live for those fans, you know, that are just yeah. of the game, right? Like, I'm, I'm trying to get a, you know, yeah, you got yeah. Gamecock Jesus here. So I wanted to give him a quick <laughs> shout out. They did it for him. You know, one of the true super fans of college sports mm -hmm. and uh, a guy that just, you know, with a stiff chin and you know, we lost him this year. So anyways, moving over to... Well, the felt, my friend, staying south with it, but a little bit into Georgia. We're talking about the greatest week of all of sports, and we were lucky enough mm -hmm. to have on a guy covering this event, Ozzo and Colt Nost, who you'll hear from later, covers the Masters, literally be boots on the ground, on the course, providing insight and analysis from the felt of Augusta. But if you're thinking about the three best weeks of the year, I'm thinking Christmas, I'm thinking the Masters, and I'm thinking the week your wife takes her annual girls' trip and gets out of town. I mean, we're talking about the three, yeah. one of the Triple Crown best, you know, weeks of the year, arguably, mm -hmm. if not the best. Maybe the your, when your wife leaves, that might be the best. Who knows? I don't know what you got going on at home, but there's nothing better than Augusta. I mean, we're talking about just the mecca of all of golf, all of sports. Azo, I just wanted to touch on just a couple of my favorite holes. Nosti, obviously, I won't give too much away, but he had mentioned number 12, the Golden Bell. I mean, it's tough to top that. Tucked into Amen Corner, the par three, a silky little cheeky par mm -hmm. three. Everything bleeds towards the water. Another hole I love is number 16. That creates a lot of late drama in terms of another par three. There's water in play. That hole, I believe, is called mm -hmm. Red Bud playing about 170 yards over the water. So just touch on Augusta uh, in terms of just what it means. I mean, you're going to be glued on your couch all weekend. No, watching this, this is an absolute dart fest. I mean, the Masters app is unbelievable. Yeah. Coverage. Just just talk about it head to toe. 
Yeah, no, it's the best. It really is. It's my favorite golf tournament. I know uh, the majors are all awesome, so it's they're they're real close together. But the Masters, it doesn't get beat. I just love that they play at the same course every time, and it's like the mecca of golf and grass. Um, but everything about it's so sick. Driving in the Masters dinner, the Champions dinner that they have, um, the concession stands, the rules, no phones, just everything about it is is unbelievable and. You know what? I'm just so fired up to have these live guys and PGA guys at the same tournament. And I just saw Brooksy doing Brooksy things. He had an interview and an inter uh, <laughs> a reporter asked him, like, do you think it's possible for you to shoot 59 at this tournament? And Brooksy's response was, have you ever played this course? Uh, no, I haven't. Yeah, I could tell <laughs> by that question. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah, I, yeah, I could that. tell by that question. <laughs> Brooksy it's is like, the no, best. And the you live can't guys... shoot a 59. No, you, you can't dart 59 here, pal, but thanks for the question. Thank you for your time, and thank you for being a part of Masters Week. Speaking of live guys, though, Oz, I'm just looking at the big board. I want to get into some of picks. Maybe you had a chance to look at some different guys. Obviously, we asked Nosti mm -hmm. later in the show about his picks, the expert's opinion, but I'm looking at a couple different things right here, and I want to get your opinion on I got John Rahm to win. That's plus 1,100. I really like him for a top 10 finish at plus 115. I think that's a good sprinkle there in terms of the value. He's a guy that I think is going to be in the mix come Sunday and at plus 115. Not you know crazy odds, but definitely sprinkle some cash there with uh, being on the, the plus side of things. Another guy, a sneaky one, I think is a decent pick, Azo, is Sam Burns. Sam Burns to finish yeah. top 20. Now that is plus 190. He has four top 10s in 2024. He's been playing really well this year. Obviously looking to stay on that heater Yes, Augusta is a different animal, but if you're looking at a top 20 like finish at some pretty good odds, plus 190 is pretty good. Now, another one I wanted to ask you about is your boy and our boy, the hotel chain himself. Ho Mr. Hotel tonight, Wyndham never hung Clark. He's never played at the Masters. He has played Augusta four times, but not at the Masters. A top 10 finish for the hotel chain, hotel tonight, is plus 330. Do you like that, or you, can you not even really? sprinkle that just knowing his name? Yeah, plus 330 for a top 10. That's, yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I That's a good bet right are they there. Just, are, they, are they just having to try to take the bait in because he's playing well? They he's might a good, be. You know, stretch, and he's never played Augusta, though. This is a different animal. I don't know. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'd be scared. They, they might be baiting us there because – I haven't heard Wyndham's name or, you know, Radisson's name um, too often <laughs> recently. So I don't know. <laughs> you know, how I feel about Wyndham fucking. Yeah, I do. Yeah, we can. We, yeah, the hotel, hotel <laughs> Mr. Hotel tonight. That's one I'm iffy on. Again, just the odds stand out to me. Another that's a good guy, bet, though. I, I think so. There's another guy that stands out to me is a 20 year old just turned pro. This is Nick Dunlop, top ranked junior golfer mm. in the class of 2022. And he's now the number one. He was the number one amateur. He won the Amex Championship back in January. He is the first amateur to win a PGA event in 33 years. The last guy to do it was Philly Ferda Mickelson. So Nick Dunlop Beauty. obviously has never played this tournament, but a top 20 finish is plus 650. So if you're looking for like a long shot, a Cinderella story, something cool to bet on, I wouldn't necessarily throw the goddamn farm on that one, but maybe sprinkle it. I think that's a decent bet. But some of the ones I really like here, Ozzo, Tiger Woods to make the cut at plus 120. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, Eldrick. I think if he's going to be in the mix, he's going to be in the mix. Top 30 finish for Eldrick is plus 170. Now, someone was tweeting out earlier in the week that he shot like 31 on the back on a Monday. It's like, okay, that's great, and that's unbelievable. But, boys, cool. we, we talking about practice. I mean, it's the old <laughs> yeah. Allen Iverson line. We, we, we talking about practice. Not not not, not the game. Practice. Not not the game that I give it my not all. We, we, we talking about practice, man. Like, <laughs> come on. We are we really throwing out Tiger Fire to thirty one? I mean, he could do that in his sleep in any practice mm -hmm. round. Think about mm -hmm. how hard it is when you get inside the ropes. The pins are tucked. The people, the patrons are around. It's mm -hmm. Jim Nance on the call. I mean, it's a whole different animal. I don't care if you're the greatest golfer of all time. It's no. still. The stakes are high and the chins are more tucked. So I, I don't know if Eldrick can put it together one final time. I'm hoping he can, but I'm going to take that bet. That's a Billy guarantee. Just being a Tiger guy, I got to go plus 120 on that. DJ top 20, Ozzo. 
is plus 140, Dustin Snow Johnson. I mean, you got to think a guy like that who's won there, a George, a Peach himself, could compete and at least be a top 20 like guy, no? For sure. That's a good bet, too. DJ's going to show up. Yeah. So I got that, DJ. And then, you know, Nosty, he had mentioned one of the guys is a sleeper, Xander Shoffley, at plus 1,600 to win. I like that one. I think, you know, just talking to him, it's only a matter of time before he breaks through. Colin Marakawa, top 10 finish, plus 375. I would sprinkle some action on that one. I think the California kid can get it mm -hmm. done at least inside the top 10. One bet I think is hilarious that I, I hate rooting against guys, but it just stuck, it kind of just stuck out to me in terms of like, well, I might take this one. Jason, you had a bad day to miss the cut at plus 245. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that one too. <laughs> Jason, I, I don't know. Missing, like, I feel like you can, missing the cut. Yeah, yeah that's, I, like, I might I feel sprinkle like there's one guy that can miss. If there's yeah. like one like guy that's just kind of all over the place the last few years, like you know, mm -hmm. I, I think like I'm I'm maybe looking at that. Did you have like anything Jordan, you on your own? Yeah, there? yeah. I mean, I I like. I don't know if you watched the Valero Open. I watched the finish. Um, this this Akshay Batia guy. He's a lefty. Yes. Lefties do well. Lefties do well at Augusta. Um, he was firing, man. He was firing. He won the he he won the playoff. He was, I think he finished dash 21. I think third place was dash 11. So he, he absolutely crumbled the field pretty much. And he's playing well. He's a young kid. First, he had to win that tournament to get in the Masters. I like his I like his odds, at least making the top 20. I think he's going to play well. And then, Jordo, another, another bet I always do at the Masters. It's a lock. I don't know what the odds are. Probably not great, but it's an absolute lock. Freddie Couples making the cut. The guy always does well the first two days. He fires on that course. He's got a green jacket. Um, Freddie Couples make the cut. Okay. I think Freddie's playing. He might have been hurt, but if he is in, I love that bet. Is he, is he hurt? Uh, he he withdrew from a Champions Tour event like two weeks ago, so I'm not sure if he's in the field. I'm hoping he's playing. I haven't got word on if he is. Honestly, I hope he is because you're so right. How smooth is that guy's swing, Freddie oh, Ferda? So unbelievable. Butter. You know, he's had like, he's almost been married. Like, I don't want to like start rumors about the guy, but it's kind of well known, especially in the golf circuit and just through the grapevine. I think he's been almost married two or three times. And I think, I mean, I'm pretty he, well confirmed on this. If I don't want to break the news. Old shoot, right? He, yeah, he, he packs up in the middle of the night and leaves. Like, even if he owns the house, <laughs> like, he just he packs up in the middle of the night and heads out and like sends him a note, like, yeah, I got cold feet, you know. Yeah, yeah just yeah. He, he, Freddie has commitment issues. Who doesn't over here? Fuck, yeah. Freddie, you're all right, buddy. <laughs> Stay with it. Stay with it. So I think that's just that's a little good. funny bit on Freddie. I mean, he's the ultimate guy in and around the clubhouse, a guy mm -hmm. that's always around Ryder Cups, the Tiger Woods, you know, connoisseur, just always around him. So hopefully Freddie's in. I haven't gotten word on that. Azo going to be a great week. Again, we chatted with the man, the myth, the legend, Colt Nost over here. He's going to be on the course, boots on the ground at Augusta starting, I believe, today he flew in. So great chat with him. Azo, let's send it over to the Frozen Four special. We had Denver's coach. Man, we've been buzzing these interviews. We had DC on. That dropped on Monday. So, folks, if you haven't checked that out, please go over to our YouTube page. Watch that. We had Denver's head coach stop by. Talk everything Frozen Four, coaching the modern-day athlete, and just the state of college hockey and a few different things. Azo, i known DC for a little bit. Not well in any terms, but he was a guy that was in the Green Bay system, and he had coached my mm -hmm. brother a little bit, and obviously – you know, I played against him at Denver as a student coach and then the assistant. I was just very impressed with his level-headedness, his approach, and how he was just able to get across so a message simple. in very simple words, but so effective. Like, he was – I was very impressed. I was too. Yeah, I knew I would be too, you know, going in. And you have known him a little bit. I've never really talked with him, but you can just tell just the way he carries himself – um, you don't even have to listen to him talk the way he carries himself and walks around. That's kind of who he is. You can already tell just by looking at him and yeah, he was just unbelievable. And I loved that, you know, we were able to ask him some of those questions, um, 
I thought I thought it was cool. He's like, yeah, I, I mean, I cheer for the NCHC, you know, like, yeah, because you asked him that that question. I mean, you got to be kind of pumped. He's like, yeah, there's a little bit of that, but you want the NCHC to win. And then just talking, you know, relating to younger players, he's like, I mean, it's pretty easy. It doesn't matter how old you are. If you're an older coach, a younger coach, you just got to talk to the guys. There's got to be a good stream of communication. And that's what it boils down to. You know, you got to you got you to get to know the players and then you just got to have an open line of communication where everyone's on the same page and he made it sound pretty simple, man, but it's, it is really simple. You know, when you, when you say it out loud, it's just another thing to actually do it in real life. And he actually, you can tell he does it in real life. Yeah. And as you mentioned, just rooting for the NCHC and talking about that, uh, of how you're, you're kind of a, a band of brothers. And I thought it was really cool that Jim Montgomery had kind of started that in the NCHC in terms mm -hmm. of, when you guys beat him out in Tampa Bay, he was the first guy to tweet out, hey, I hope North Dakota wins. I mean, that is yeah, that is a very classy fella, and that's no secret why he is where he is in Jimmy Ferd of Montgomery. And if you're learning from a guy like that and you're able to take in little things that you notice in terms of even going back to when they lost to UMass Slamhurst, Ozzo, he, the first mm -hmm. thing he did was share his notes with Duluth. I thought that was such a classy move Sick. too in terms of, hey, here's our pre-scout. Yeah. Here's what they do. Here's their tendencies. I'm not sure if it's going to help you, but I hopefully it does, and hopefully you're able to game plan a little bit off of what we had in terms of going into our pre-scout. So I just thought DC was such a mature guy. I mean, only 34 years old. He'd been coaching since he was 18. So thanks again for DC mm -hmm. stopping on, and good luck to him. Azo, I'm cheering for those guys in the Frozen Four. I obviously had picked BC, but fuck those guys. I'm all in on DC, Johnny Chan for style. Sure. But speaking of winning, Azo, we want to talk a little bit about the Hobie Baker. That'll be... Awarded on Friday, obviously a UND product, and Jackson Blake is up for it in the Hobie hat trick. Who do you see winning this? Obviously, there's always East Coast bias. There's obviously a little bit of that coming into play with two of the East Coast mm -hmm. players, but they deserve it, rightfully so. Who do you have winning your Hobie, taking it home on Friday uh, if you were a betting man? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll mention Blaker. I think he does deserve to be on the on this list, the top three. Um he had an incredible season and he, he was one of the top three players in, in college hockey. Unfortunately, he's not going to win it. Um, it comes down to cutter Goche. He's got the most goals in the NCAA. So, and then, and then you got this Macklin Celebrini, this kid who's going to get drafted first overall, who do you pick? You know, you got Goche who just backed out on Philly, um, gets traded to Anaheim. I believe, you know, he's got that going on. And then you got this Macklin Celebrini who's going to go one overall, um, I feel like you got to give it to Macklin Celebrini. If you're college hockey, you need that number one overall pick um, to be the Hobie Baker winner. So I feel like he is going to win it. Yeah, I think that's a safe call. I am going to go on the other side of Boston over to Chestnut Hill. I'm going to go turd cutter Gautier. I think it plays into the theatrics of what he did this year in terms of saying, hey, I fella. I ain't going to torts. I, I, I'm good. You know, you can trade me yeah. or I ain't going to sign. So <laughs> yeah. I am going to go over to Cutter Gochi. I think he's going to win it. Now, I do think that it's it's a tight race. And normally, mm -hmm. Azo, it's, you know, you have an idea. It's kind of clear cut. Yeah. They award it. Right. Exactly. You have an idea. You think you, you're going to know who wins it. Now, the one year I just remember that I thought Matt Fratton was going to win it back in the day, and they gave it to Andy Mealy. Now, was it because Fratton threw a lawnmower in the middle of the street and had a couple you know, citations? We'll leave it at that. I'm not sure. But this year, more than ever, it feels like it's a two-head race. Now, Blaker, I think he's right there, but I, I think it's 1A, 1B, and then there's two. So mm -hmm. I just think the two Boston kids, it's a flip of the coin. Now, who's had the more impressive year? Obviously, the Gautier with a lot more For goals. Sure. I don't know how the point total is. It's crazy. A guy like Will Smith is left off the list. And he leads the nation mm -hmm. in points. I mean, that's, it's just wild to think that weird. I don't know. We'll, we'll see who it is. I, I think you can't go wrong either way, but as you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. It's, it's going to be interesting on Friday and I, I'm not left to try to maybe find a line on that. Maybe you have to text a bookie offshore and see if we can get yeah. that. Cause I can't find a line on that, but Azo, I know I picked BC, but I'm rooting for our boy DC with DU. Wanted to ask you, what, what are we thinking for this week in terms of Frozen Four? Thursday, Saturday, obviously, we've got two games going off the box in St. Paul on mm -hmm. Thursday and then sliding over to Saturday. Like, 
are we going to get some decent crowds? I mean, we joke with DC, like, fella, the only people that travel from Denver is the goddamn band. I mean, Michigan, like, they don't historically <laughs> yeah. travel all that well. I mean, I've been to Frozen Fours even back in the day when I think college hockey was a little bit more prevalent. And still, Michigan, okay crowds. I think it'll be decent because it's in Minnesota. But are teams like BC and BU really bringing a solid fan base to St. Paul? Like, is this going to be sold out, or are there going to be empty seats at the XL Energy Center? Because you hate to see the bar mm. not full, fella. No, the, the barn will for sure be full just from Frozen Four fans. I don't think any of these teams are bringing in a fan base that's going to like overtake the crowd. I think most of the fans in there, most of the people in the seats will just be hockey fans that just enjoy watching the game. Um, and they'll probably pick a side to cheer for. But yeah, that's kind of unfortunate. There won't be like a real fan base there. I mean, I've seen, you know, I've been in Frozen Fours with BU and BC in them and they don't bring a ton. And I've been in frozen fours with Denver. They don't, they don't bring a ton. I, I've never been in a frozen four with Michigan, but I, I remember we played in Cincinnati, I think against them. And that was like, not that far away from Ann Arbor, not a ton of Michigan fans there. So I just don't see a lot of them bringing too many fans. Yeah, it was funny. After we got off the call, I remember I was tripping DC about their their fan base not bringing a whole yeah. lot of action. And he's like, he was <laughs> yeah. telling us like, well, we sold out Coors Field and we had, you know, 30,000 other people. I forget at uh, the other stadium outdoor when they played CC. And he sent mm -hmm. me a picture on his wall of those games sold out. And I said, fella, let's Did see you this weekend. Hey, you know, like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. like, hey, swish. We get fans. So we'll see DC. <laughs> we'll see. But you got to wonder, Azo. I mean, you're speaking on just college hockey fans and you know, the state of hockey does well. There's always people in and around watching mm -hmm. college hockey. There'll be a sold out crowd there. You know that, but you got to wonder, there's got to be some trim walking in over there across the bridge from the university of Minnesota into dinky town, maybe looking to get a one-way deal from a guy like Celebrini or Hudson, or For maybe sure. even Gautier. There's going to be some ladies and some honeys coming over from the golden gophers somehow finding their way in and around St. Paul, because you know, as you know, it's it's the state of hockey and the women oh. there, you know, they some of them or yeah. most of them, they appreciate a decent looking you, puck player. You know how many girls are getting DMs right now? Hey, what are you doing Wednesday oh. night? You know, like what are you doing Wednesday? Yeah. You know, you want to you want to check <laughs> well, out the Wyndham? You want to check out the Radisson? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Saying at the Radisson Blue, do you have a car on campus or can I get you the Uber? You know, can I get 100%. you the comfort? I'm not getting the black. Yeah. A lot of those guys that are coming here to play on both on all these teams, they come to Minnesota, some of them to train, some of them to hang out with their buddies, go on Lake Minnetonka. They're here in the summer. They know some of these girls that are going to the U of M. 100 percent they're getting DMs. Yeah, there's going to be a good flock of them in St. Paul this weekend, I think. You gotta love the beauties that used to post and still do it where all you do is you you get off the plane, you're right on the tarmac, or you maybe get to the rink or the hotel, and you just take a picture, like a random picture, a, a totally mm -hmm. just burger of a picture, and you just throw St. out the Paul. geotech. St. Yeah. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> just, sudden, just letting just, them know, letting them know. <laughs> oh, man. And all of a sudden, it's like a slot machine. It just starts filing in, you know? It's just like, oh, my God, just letting the honeys know, boys. Eh? It's a tale as old as time, so. That'll be funny to see the crowd there. We wish the boys the best of luck on and off the ice. But, hey, focus on the game, boys. As we know over here, you know you only get one or two cracks at that, maybe one if you're lucky. So leave it all on the line out there on the sheet. And, hey, whatever happens after that happens. But, Azo, going over to my favorite part of the show, we got a couple one-hitters with the captain. I got my first question is Augusta-related. If you were a betting man, which you are, are you taking Live or the PGA field to come out as the winner of this year's 88th edition of the Masters? Oh, I'm going Live. I think they pull it off. Love that. I just I just like where Liv's at right now. And I think they got some steam. And this is just gonna it'll it'll kind of break the golf world if a Live guy wins. Because Rombo was a PGA guy last year. So he was a PGA guy until it financially didn't make sense to be a pga guy so you gotta love <laughs> yeah. that you gotta love that I, i'm with you there i hope rombo i'm honestly hoping a guy like dj snow can come out of the wickets mm -hmm. and just somehow win uh, i think that would piss a lot of people off or Brooks Kepka, so that would be nails if that was done number two Ozzo, if denver wins at all and that's the natty chip they secure their 10th championship in school history is a guy like david carl in the national hockey league next year hundred percent. I was just, I forget who I was talking to about this. 
Um, it might've been on Twitter, but I'm like, yeah, this guy is, he's gone next year or the year after. And I don't know. I th- there's gotta be teams calling after this year for sure. You'd think I mean, we talked about it a little bit last episode. Yeah. I I'm fully with you. I'm very impressed by DC. And if he wants to do it, he's there. Number three, as a single guy, as of which you were, you know, three, four years ago, what's fucking worse, man? Laundry or dishes? I mean, I just had a three-day bout with laundry. Like, I, I literally wore everything in my closet for probably a month. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was working out in Lululemon chino pants at one point because I just didn't want to do the laundry. Like, <laughs> yeah. it was just absurd. <laughs> like, I'm pulling out shit that I would never wear. I'm wearing fucking chino pants, short as boxers. Yeah, oh, yeah. Like, what am I doing? I'm wearing a turtleneck and I'm going out and it's 75 degrees. Oh, yeah, it looks pretty good. <laughs> How about you just do your fucking laundry, you asshole? <laughs> laundry. Laundry's way, I mean, laundry's terrible. I have a, it's, it's just like, like I, I have too many clothes in my closet so I can go through them. I can, I can go weeks without doing my laundry. And then once I'm out, I'm like, holy fuck, I got an absolute mountain of laundry to do. And I gotta, I gotta switch it over the dryer. And then as soon as it gets out of the dryer, I gotta fold it or hang it up so it doesn't get wrinkled. I mean, holy Christ. I've thought about, Jordan, this is a kind of a funny story, but we had a guy at mini movers on uh work comp or he was just injured. So we had to have him doing some things. And I'm like, Hey buddy, I got a fuckload of laundry. You got to take this little laundromat and do my laundry, you know? So I got, I got a mountain of laundry done by one of my employees at mini movers. Cause he was on the, he was on the bench injured and we didn't have much for him to do. So I'm like, Hey, this is a fucking great thing for you to do. Just sit at the laundromat and watch, just go through the washer. That's so that's so huge. He's on the IR and you just put him to work. I love that. Also, I was telling my parents, my folks down here, when they were down here this past weekend, I was like, I would literally, if, if I'm single past, I don't know, a couple more years, like I, I think I would seriously consider having just like a live-in Russian chick or a, a nice Mexican for chick, sure. some sort of cleaner, just to follow me it's around, like a house manager, clean up after me. Yeah, be a house manager and I'll pay you. Yeah. We'll give you a decent salary. We'll put you on a meal plan. You can live in the spare bedroom. We don't have to sleep mm-hmm. together. Just stay in the spare bedroom. We'll put mm-hmm. you on salary. All you have to do is do my laundry, make my bed, do my sheets. Like, I am so bad at that shit, man. It's crazy how bad. It's actually embarrassing. Like, yesterday, I legitimately did laundry for five hours after I got. It was like a, also, it was a shift from like eight p.m. to one a.m. And I'm sitting there like, this fucking sucks. So, and then you get, you know, you're doing dishes, you cook a couple nights, and all of a sudden it's stacked up like Denny's at 3 a.m. after a Saturday prom. It's like, holy fuck. So that is, uh, as a dude, single, I just those things I just I don't do well. So I'm with you there. I think laundry takes the cake. Ozzo, fourth question, last one. Man, I got a bone to pick with you. It's just hilarious. It's speaking of just you know being pathetic around the house. My Christmas tree is still up. So I've been letting this bad boy ride since December. It's been a Martin Luther Ferda tree. It's been a Swish Tines, a Valentine's tree. It's been a St. Patty's oh, yeah. Day tree, an Easter tree, Mother's Day tree. It's going to be a 4th of July tree. Who fucking knows? So why? what I wanted to ask you is, do I let this thing ride, baby, ride? Or do I take this thing down? I mean, it's, it's borderline embarrassing at this point. But you know what? We're almost at the halfway point. Like this, respectively, could go back up in... Yeah. November. So really, I mean, we're almost halfway there. Do I just ride this thing out or do I take it down? I mean, I had my sister in town. I was like, Kylie, can you just take this thing down? I'm like, wait, actually, I don't know. I kind of like it. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if I want it down. <laughs> oh yeah. It's fucking, well, it's not the love. Yeah. No, it's, I, I, I think it, I mean, at this point it's, it's hilarious. I think you ride it out. I mean, I've, I've been in that spot too before I've, I've been like, holy fuck, this thing's still up, but it's kind of sick. You know, you turn the lights on. It's like, it's pretty good feel. Like, why why would I take yeah. this thing down? I mean, who doesn't want a tree with lights in their fucking living room? I mean, it's great. <laughs> it feels like when you're in a college house, you know, when you have all the the, the yeah. Christmas tree lighting like up along the oh, edges. Yeah. Like it literally feels like I'm in it's kind of a nice little mood setter, too. And I, I think just if you have a you know a overnight guest over or even a buddy come over, they're like, mm-hmm. Jesus Christ, swish. Like the, the tree is still <laughs> up. I'm like, fella, put a fucking present under because you know. You're in a blink of an eye, and all of a sudden it's gonna be Christmas. And I'm gonna be asking you for something, so just put it there right now while you can, because yeah. you know pretty soon this thing's gonna be a bad of an eye. So yeah, it's just it's pathetic and hilarious at the same time. But I don't know. Uh, I'm still on the fence with it. I just don't know if I want to take it down. But folks, that was one hitters with the captain. As always, we are moving over to nail gun of the week. Azo, what did you have for that, my friend? I had. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, Jordo, but. 
John Rahm and uh, Tyrell Hatton, they're caddies. Did you see this? I did not. <laughs> they're their caddies couldn't. Their caddies couldn't, they had to. They had to find replacement caddies for the last day of their last tournament, because their caddies uh, apparently, in the interview, um, got injured from falling over after dinner. Both of them. No. Couldn't caddy so the cut. next day, <laughs> and they and, and they're both laughing when they're answering. So like, clearly these caddies on Friday night or whatever, because Liv plays their final the final round on Saturday, I think, or. Maybe it's Sunday. Maybe it was Saturday night they were boozing. But yeah, they must have been so cut. <laughs> they injured themselves and couldn't caddy the next day. And <laughs> God damn it, that's nail gun, baby. That's so sick. And we were talking to Nosty about last last call Lance, the former caddy. Like, imagine yeah. getting so cockeyed you just faint or you fall down and your chin hits the ground and you can't caddy for the <laughs> only guy you caddy. have to like it's your only job is to carry wrenches and you can't do it yeah. because you got so banged up. It's like, fella, come on. That is all time. I love that. I uh my nail gun of the week. I had Gamecock Jesus, who we had mentioned previously, just an absolute gun. I mean, mm. South Carolina getting it done Good for call. Gamecock Jesus. You have to give him a little face time, even six feet under. So, Gamecock fella, if you're listening from somewhere in a grave in South Carolina, just know the boys at Live and Five are giving you love and deserve everything because you are a legend. And I don't know how I'm just learning about you, but thank you for crossing over my chin and seeing that because what a legend. Gamecock Jesus, one time, baby. Azo, my celly of the week, I had Dave Portnoy with the UConn Future. He put 600 k on the Huskies to Unreal. win, I believe, in December. He cashed out at $2.6 million. That is $2.1 milli right in the pocket. How are you? No spit, no lube. That is a nice overall tug with a little bit of lube on it, honestly. So Dave Portnoy is my celly of the week. He was watching the game literally stones throw away from my place over at DraftKings in North Scottsdale. So good to see Prez is like doing well, a degenerate gambler. And that is my celly of the week. Fella, what'd you have? I had, uh, I was just, wa I, I was watching Ovi's goal today's 30th and I had to pick him just because one of the, one part I've loved about Ovi's his whole career as how fired up he gets when he scores a goal. He's got 852 goals now, and he gets just as fired up for his next one as he did his first one or, you know, whenever. And it was just a classic OV sell. He goes down to a knee, double fist pump, comes back up, another double fist pump, just screaming, so fired up to score his fucking 852nd goal in the National Hockey League. I mean, it's insane. This guy's almost, most guys don't even play that many games. He's got this many goals. It's just insane. And, I had to shout Ovi out for a celly. He just he still gets so fired up when he scores a goal. It's so sick. Yeah, I mean he's he's a kid in the candy store. That's why you love him. I mean he's still excited. That tuck he had was so sick. I mean we were doing the game here on Tuesday, Hockey Night in Scottsdale, and the way he just tucked that all the way down the felt, just a stick side, seeing eye shot, almost posted it on the short side. Beat Alex Lyon, former Yale product and Lake of the Woods, Minnesota. So love that, Azo. Azo, that was the pre-show, tape to tape, as always with you, my friend, episode number 33. Again, we're going to send it over to Colt Nost right now, and we're going to get a Augusta breakdown. The master special over here at Live in 5. Cap, always good snapping a tape to tape with you. Have a good night, my friend. And, folks, we hope you enjoyed this one. Fala. Now introducing... From the rodeo grounds of Pilot Point, Texas, this Lone Star State native graduated from Southern Money University in 2007, where he earned all conference and all regional honors. He then took his bag of wrenches along with a 12 pack of Bud Heavies to the PGA Tour, earning his card in 2009. Nosty is famously known to shape the ball both ways and can make a putt from the parking lot, traded in his Texas wedge in 2020 for a mic and has been crushing it ever since. You can now catch him talking four iron stingers on his podcast, Subpar, as well as on the course commentator for CBS alongside the great Jim Nance. The official master whisperer of the Live and Five podcast and avid hockey fan. Folks, without further ado, please welcome Colt Nost 
to the Live and Five podcast. How are we doing, brother? Thank you for taking the time to join the boys over here. Thank you so much. That was definitely the most unique intro I've ever had. So well done on that. That was awesome. <laughs> Yeah, you know, no, see, I like I like to tell our guests that come on, they don't really know I do it. It's it's my radio voice, it's my alter ego. I call myself the fella over here at 93.1. So definitely hitting the airways. It's like a strip club DJ. You know what I mean? You got the announcer as Caramel or Mercedes is coming on stage. I like to think I could get that intro for her, you know, making her way to the pole. So now thanks again for coming on. And you know, I ran into you last week at over at DraftKings Sports Book. We were over there for the IceCon spit and chiclets kind of bar stool shindig and you were sitting there with uh you know a former und sioux grad mike commodore obviously gage and i we played at north dakota and you're sitting there with commie but that table you were sitting there with nosti i mean you were in you what you could talk all the shit you wanted sitting there i mean you had some big boys there you had commie jared bull jody shelley so you could get away with goddamn murder sit with those boys but just talk about your kind of relationship with those guys obviously being an avid hockey fan and you like to tip it out down here at whisper rock with uh mike commodore as well oh yeah so i've i've for some reason i mean it's not a shock i guess i've always hit it off with the hockey guys they like to have some cocktails play some golf and talk some shit which is pretty much all yeah. i do so I, I get along with those guys very well. Uh, I met Mike Commodore. I remember before I actually lived out here in Scottsdale, myself and Graham Dillette went and played TPC Scottsdale one morning. He said, hey, my buddy, this ex-hockey player is going to join us. Do you care? And I was like, absolutely not. So Mike Commodore. And I had heard the name, didn't know much about him. Come out, didn't, he didn't talk for 18 holes. And I'm like, dude, this guy's kind of, kind of boring. Who the hell is this? Well, then you get to know Commie and you realize uh, he was just being a little shy that day because now he doesn't <laughs> shut up but he is one of my favorite humans. You know, I, I do, you, you mentioned the podcast subpar. It's a golf podcast. And by far the person we get asked to have back on more than anyone is Mike Commodore. Incredible storyteller. He's yeah. hilarious. And like you said, a rather big dude. So I feel comfortable when we're out in public with him. If, uh, if I happen to talk some shit to the wrong person. Yeah. Commie was probably, you just caught him on a day. Maybe he was at the dirty dog saloon late night. And he was probably just, you know, a, a little hung or a little stung because once those stories get rolling, he is all the time. He's one of my favorite UND guys to hang out with. Like when we were kind of coming up my freshman year, uh, Kami was still playing. So you come into pro camp or you'd even, you know, after the season would come up and kind of show the boys the, the ropes, so to say. I mean, I always tell the story on this podcast, but he was a guy that actually brought a sociology professor to a party my freshman year his name was frank white aka francis white and the whole party was chanting frank the tank frank the tank like straight out of old school so that was my introduction to mike commodore just a full-on legend but no steve while we have you here obviously next week going into the holy grail of golf we have the 88th edition of the masters straight out of augusta georgia you're going to be working that with jim nance the legend and obviously, uh, you know, you're doing great things with CBS, and I love listening to you. But just touch on Augusta. I mean, how the Mecca, is it as good as it looks in, on TV? I mean, it just looks crispy, brother. It's just like not even a pine, you know, like a pine cone or just it's not out of place. It's just crazy. There's nothing out of place. You will find nothing out of place. It's it's the greatest golf course in the world. Um, it is such a you know an honor to be there every year covering it. I, I believe my first year was 2021. So this will be my, my fourth Masters, going there and covering it with CBS. But it is truly special. To, the, the first year I ever stepped foot on the grounds was in 2021, and it was limited patrons that year because of COVID and everything. So I, mm -hmm. I, it was so great to go out there and be able to walk every single hole. Like I went out there Monday by myself, walked all 18 holes, and just took it all in. But even then, like when I wasn't working, I could go out there and watch buddies, and you didn't have to worry about missing shots or anything like that. It was It was a really cool first experience for me, but – it's one, man, we get we get hyped up for every year. It's the first major. It's obviously been a while since we've had a major. And this year, I think it's going to be as exciting as anything. I think the buildup coming in with everything that's going on between PGA Tour and Liv, um, you know, how Liv, you know, they keep getting better better players. They've got a lot of great players over there. And so, therefore, mm -hmm. we don't get to see the best of the best play each other as often as we would like. So, this is going to be the first time in 2024 for the most part. And I'm ready for it, man. It's going to be a hell of a Masters. Yeah, it was it was unreal last year. I think it was when that tree fell down, like in the middle of the fairway or right around the tee box. And then like four hours later, or whatever it was, it, did, it looked like nothing even happened. It's like, how does this ground screw just get everything cleaned up? They make it look so crispy, crispy rice, as I like to call it. But if you're looking at the Masters, you're looking at the field, you'll see like, who do you have for your favorite? Is it hard to go against a guy like the Scoot 
Scotty Scheffler, I mean, if he can putt and he can play the way he can, it's pretty hard to bet against him, no? You know, I've, I've been off the last six or seven weeks, and it's getting closer to the Masters, and every time I'm out at a bar or whatever, hanging out, people always be like, who do you like? And I'm like, I mean, it's, it's obvious, isn't it? Yeah. The guy is a massive favorite. He was a two-and-a-half-to-one favorite at Houston last week, ended up missing that short putt to get into a playoff. And, you know, depending on where you look at it, he's four, four-and-a-half-to-one to win the Masters, which is just insane. I mean, that's Tiger-like numbers. Mm-hmm. He's, he's a huge favorite, and it's – and honestly, he deserves to be. I mean, that's how well he's been playing. And in these big events, you look back to the Arnold Palmer Invitational at Bay Hill where he cruised the victory. And then the players, he shoots that insane 64 on Sunday to, to run those boys down and, and win another one. Like, I mean, he's the best player in the world, and it's really not close right now. Hmm. No, see, do you think those guys coming from Liv, they're used to playing three rounds instead of the full four? Does that have any, like, does that set them back a little bit when they come into a major? Is that just not as big of a deal? You know, I think last year we kind of thought it might a little bit, but then you go out there and you you see the way they played. I mean, Brooks was leading the entire week at the Masters last year before John Rahm took over. Phil Mixon finished second. Brooks went on to to win the PGA Championship. So, no, I'm not worried about those guys at all. Yeah. I mean, what, what Brooks Kepka does in majors is just phenomenal. His record is ridiculous. And – for some reason, I mean, when that bell goes off in the big ones, Brooks brings the brings his best to the table, and I mean, he's got five of them already. And even though, like most of us over here in America, like we haven't seen these guys play much this year, but I can promise you, he, him, John Rom, who I played with just I played with twice the week before last up at Whisper Rock, those boys, uh, Dustin Johnson, uh, Cam Smith, they're they're going to be ready to go. It wouldn't be surprise surprise me one bit if one of those guys contended. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you, Nosti, in terms of just if you were a betting man, are you, are you taking a PGA guy or a live guy? Or is it kind of just, you know, whoever's buzzing that week and really has it going? Is, are these live guys, they're up to the, you know, the challenge, and especially a major, especially going into Augusta. Like, they're they're all in on this, no? Oh, of course they are. I mean, this is what they do for a living. You know, they've been criticized a lot for, for going to live, but it's generational money. It's hard to turn down, but they're still competitors. This is what they've trained their whole life to do, and if you can't get up for the masters, I don't know what you're doing because uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the second you step foot on the grounds, it's a special feeling. It just feels bigger. Um, you're probably more nervous than you are at any other tournament. And you know that your name will be in forever associated with Augusta national golf club, the masters. And that's, that's incredible. I mean, that for us as golfers, I mean, as a kid, you're on the putting green at 10 years old saying, you know, this putts to win the masters. It's just, you every single person yeah. in the world, can probably tell you what every hole at Augusta National is. If you've watched golf at all, like it's the most, yeah. mm-hmm. just because they go there every single year. So every time they go to some camera shot, you're like, oh, that's six. Oh, that's eight. Like everyone knows. And it's so yeah. special. And I can't wait for it to get started. That's what I wanted to ask you. Do you have a favorite hole at Augusta if you're looking at just one yeah. pinpointing it? Yeah. So I, obviously there's so many just gorgeous holes. But I remember when I went out and I walked the first time, I made my way to number 10 and walked down the hill, and it's just gorgeous looking at that green down the hill. But then you go to the tee box on 11, and it's kind of a little uphill, and then right before you get to the top of the hill, it, it peaks down to where you drive the golf ball, and you see 11 green and 12 green. It's like one of the most gorgeous things I've ever seen. And I got to the 12th tee box, uh, the, the iconic par three, and it was about as amazing. As I, it was better than I could even imagine. I just sat there for like yeah. 10 minutes by myself and just and looked around. And I, I mean, it almost looks fake. It's that beautiful, and, and it's it, and it's also a genius part three. The way it is designed, the really small green, the way it angles with Ray's Creek, it's it's by far my favorite hole. But there's, I mean, there's there's a lot of them. I love thirteen, the par five. I love fifteen, the par five. Um, but yeah, twelve just it's something special. I think it's just when I walked over that hill on eleven, and you could look down at Amen Corner, it just it hit me, and I was like, man, this is really cool. Yeah, that's cool. And I wanted to ask you, Nosti, you, you know, you're walking there, you're walking the course, you're commentating, but do you have like a, a go-to snack at the Masters at the Pimento <laughs> Cheese? Like what, what are you going with, you know, pregame to get you dialed in before you step on the course to work that day or maybe after treat yourself with a, you know, a nice beer going down? What are you washing that down with? So I actually do like Pimento Cheese and this might rub some people the wrong way, but there's it just doesn't blow me away where i grew up in dallas this place called royal oaks country club theirs was phenomenal um so at augusta actually i think my favorite sandwich there is the egg salad which i never thought i would like but somebody told me to try it 
and I love it. It is fantastic, but there's so many good ones. I mean, it's hard to go wrong with the fried chicken. You know, I need to watch what I eat a little bit, so I try not to eat too many of those. Yeah. But um, it's it's pretty cool. I mean, you go down there and you get a sandwich and a beer, and they tell you it's like three bucks if you're like, this is yeah. this place. This place is just the best. Yeah, no, that's cool. And I wanted to ask you, like, when you're on the air and you're working with Jim Nance and some of the hockey guys that the commentators and especially a guy that I spent a little bit with time with in St. Louis, who was a good buddy of mine now working with the Chicago Blackhawks and Darren Pang with, they would always have like a, a big board of like buzzwords to kind of work into a broadcast. Is that something you do in terms of like play games with your buddies or like they'd have like one of their buddies call in and be like, you got to use the squirts. So like in hockey, you'd be like, you got to throw in the word squirts, like the puck squirts out to the slot. Or is it like, you know, <laughs> the goalie's as sticky as they come or something like that. Like there's nothing better than coming from behind. Like, is there different words or phrases that you're kind of working into a broadcast, you know, in terms of, you know, trying to play uh, with your buddies or is that just uh, natural, whatever comes out, comes out. No, for the most part, obviously, we take it pretty serious, especially yeah. at the Masters. But there are, like, when I'm, when I'm on the road, you know, we have this big group text with a bunch of buddies, and they'll text and be like, hey, get this word in or stuff like that. Yeah. If, it's, if it's nothing crazy, I'll do it, and it's, and it's fun. And some of them bet me that I can't. So that's yeah. obviously a challenge, and obviously one I'm going to win because I can get it in there. Right. But, uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a fun little game that can also get you in trouble if you're not careful. Yeah, 100%. Well, sure. that- I just remember like paying or like one of his calls or I, maybe even been someone else that I know just in, in commentating was like, that is a thick defenseman who is powerful from the waist down, you know, just like different mm-hmm. things. And even like Al Michaels has worked in different things over the years where like, you know, it's going to be a wet and likely wild day, you know, just in terms of like the field condition. So I, I was just like, that's like the game within the game. Like I'm sure your buddies are always texting you different things to, to kind of get different terms in. But as hockey guys know, Steve, like, even golf, I feel like they go hand in hand in terms of just golf terminology and hockey. I mean, I don't really speak English myself, and especially in a locker room, you're always trying to use different words or different creative ways to explain or articulate a shot or just, you know, what's going on. So are there different words? I, I always hear you say, like, smash and seeds. What what does that exactly mean? As a guy that pretty much knows every term in hockey, like, yeah. what do you mean by smash and seeds? Well, s- smash is just obviously you absolutely murdered it. Seeds, yep. something that golfers have just always said. It's like, oh, that was a seed. And it's just yeah. this pure pure strike okay. out there that doesn't really move. Um, you know, I like to throw in melted a lot because Kami always says says that when we yep. play golf. He's like, oh, that was melted. So I'll throw that in on, <laughs> I like in that on the broadcast for him. But the hockey guys by far have the best terminology. I mean, every time we've had one on our pod, Sleaze is always just like dying laughing. He's like, this terminology is great. I remember the first time we had Biz on, he said something about one of the fights he got in. He's like, oh, I just got Bambi. And yeah. obviously, like, you, th- you just think of it, and you're like, oh, my God, that's like that's just – it's so simple, yet it's genius. And yeah. you just picture this little baby deer wobbling, and you're like, oh, there's Biz. He just got his ass whipped, and he's over there Bambi. It's, it's great. I love y'all's terminology. 100%. I mean, I was even texting you yesterday, like, I'm going to go tee it up, and then we can go on at 530. I'm like, low and slow, no, Steve, choke and poke, too, right? Choke down yeah. and let them, and, you know? <laughs> it's just like we're always – yeah, all you hockey guys are the only ones that call me Nosty. No one calls me by my last name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. And I always like to say, maybe, hey, just a little Bob Seeger. You got to hold that thing off against the wind. You know, just some, yeah, just little terminology. Good. You know, low and slow. I like to call a, a ball a nugget. You know, hooded stinger, trap draw, uh, all of that stock. You know, it's like all these terms that you can kind of just work in. But I think that's uh, something you do really well, and you bring a lot of color to the game. But I wanted to ask you, Nosty, just in terms of. You know, you're really connected with the players. I think it's really cool how you have a relationship with a lot of guys on tour. I think in terms of just, you know, being that bridge between the older guys, the the older generation and then the players, you're kind of that mid, you know, that bridge in between. And there's some guys you probably have really good relationships on tour with. And I just wanted to ask you, like, if a guy misses a cut, say, on a, a Friday are they texting you? It's like, hey, you know, let's go to the local Chili's. Let's go have a couple beers. I got to wash this one away. Meet me here at five o'clock. Is that something, you know, just to blow off some steam? And even when you played missing a cut, is that something guys do just in terms of, uh, you know, uh, just kind of getting away from the game? Oh, 100 um, percent. And yeah, it still happens. It happened when I played. I mean, my, I always laugh, you know, Friday afternoon. I feel like people were looking to see what I was shooting because I've always been a very social guy. I know mm-hmm. a lot of people in every city we go to. I know all the good spots to go to. So Friday afternoon, if I wasn't playing well, my phone started going a little crazy. But <laughs> even for me, when, when I knew, like, say, I played Friday morning and I was going to have the weekend off, it was let's start scrolling to the bottom, see who the boys are going to miss the cut, who's a good time to go out with. Yeah. Um, so so definitely, yeah, they still message me all the time when 
because I know I'm going to be down to have a good time most evenings. But yeah, there's there's so many great guys out there, and yeah, I have a great relationship with. I mean, I my last tournament was just four years ago, so right. I, I still consider these guys really good mm-hmm. friends of me. I mean, we still go to dinner and stuff when I'm on the road. Um, a lot of the guys nowadays rent houses and have chefs because they're fancy and rich, and they're nice enough to invite me over, which is which is great. And that's one of the things though that's always the toughest for me about being on the broadcast and then being friends with these guys is, you know, they're going to tell me things that they probably mm-hmm. don't want to go on the air. And I, and I always am very careful to cross that line. Like, Hey, if they say something I think is interesting, that might be good for the broadcast. I'll always ask first because I never want to, mm-hmm. you know, have a private conversation and say something the next day to be like, dude, what the hell? Like that was not yeah. meant for, for public. And I'm like, I've- I get it. And that's one of the biggest things that always I get a little nervous about. Have they, do you notice, have players treated you differently since you started doing TV rather than when you were a player on the tour or is it kind of just the same relationship and you're just kind of one of the boys still? For the most part, it's been 100% the same, just still one of the boys. Like they know I got their back. I'm never going to say anything unfair. Like if you had a shitty shot though, I'm, I'm going to give my honest opinion. And if Mm -hmm. I think you made the wrong decision, you know, that's what I get paid to do is to give my opinion. Um, For the most part, they've all been great and maybe even nicer now because they know I can bury them on air. So they need to kiss my ass a little bit, but yeah, yeah, there's been a few that have been a little different. I'm not going to use any names when it comes to that, which has been Mm -hmm. honestly probably really disappointing for me because like they were friends of mine and not to say we're not friends, but it's definitely the relationship has changed, which I don't think it ever should because I I know I like, I know how to keep them separate. Right. Yeah. Nosti, I want to, let's get into your career. You graduated from Southern Money in 2007. Holy trim there, mind you. I, I've spent a couple nights on that campus just in and around the Dallas area. But you had a great college career. You were all-conference. And then you transitioned two wins on the nationwide tour. That was the Fort Smitty Classic and I believe the Price Cutter Championship. T3 at the Players one year, I believe, in 2016. So making that transition and getting into media, I guess, what was the transition like there? Was it just uh, some injuries? Did you have just enough of the playing days? Were you kind of grinding up and down? Talk to us about that. Yeah, so my career was kind of up and down to start. You know, I, like you said, I won what is now the Corn Ferry Tour twice right out of, way, right out of college. Got my PGA Tour card, and it's probably the worst thing that could have happened because golf was just so easy for me for two years. I feel like I won. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I did. I won, a lot of, I won a lot of tournaments, played really well. And I thought I was just going to cruise into the PGA Tour and have this massive career. And I got slapped around a little bit. I didn't probably take it as serious as I needed to, um, but still had some very solid years. And I was just really starting to feel comfortable out there in 15, 16. And then I got a hand injury um, that actually first got diagnosed wrong. And I ended up having surgery on my wrist, which wasn't the problem. The pain was always in my thumb. Um, so I, I had wrist surgery, was out nine months, came back, hit a shot in Dallas, I think my second or third week back something felt wrong again in the thumb, had it looked at and they're like, dude, your UCL and your thumb's like 95% torn. Like you have to have this thing operated on immediately. So I was out another nine months. The game had changed a lot. Obviously being out that much is really hard. Um, being away from competition for that long is very difficult. And I just, I never got my game back um, to be fair. And I was offered a serious XM job kind of as I was still playing, um, doing a show with my man, Drew Stoltz on their channel. And then the podcast came about, I'd done a few events for golf channel through CBS with, with the TV. And when I played my last event in 2020 at the Phoenix open, I had a decision to make, like, did I want to go back and chase it on the corn Ferry tour against all these young, hungry college kids that are very excited to be there. And I wasn't going to be, or I could kind of gamble on myself a little bit and take this media route and see what happens. And honestly, it's probably the best thing I've ever done. Um, It, it has changed my life. I've never been happier. I've never been less stressed. I'm just having so much fun being out there. And it's seriously, it's, it's been a game changer for me. I never thought in my life I would be on the side, carrying a microphone, following these guys around, but damn, I'm glad I'm doing it. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's crazy. That's kind of like where I was at in terms of just even my playing career knows And, you know, I played eight years, I played seven years over here and then a couple of years in Europe. And I was just like, you know, I'm 30 years old and do I really want to get into the grind of things or I kind of want to just roll the dice and get to this media thing and, and kind of see where it goes. So it's, it's really inspiring to hear, you know, you're, you're doing well, you're loving what you do. And, you know, obviously you're in a great spot, but I, I, we got to touch on that last tournament in terms of that wasted management in 2020. You had Ray Whitney, AKA the wizard on the bag. And you got to tell the folks just that little story about 16 when the whiz was just, you know, showboating a little bit. 
Well, I have to take you back to Thursday where he was shitting his <laughs> pants going into 16. Um, I mean, this is Ray Whitney, right? 23 years in the NHL. He's won a Stanley Cup. He's been under the lights. No big deal. Uh, but we get out there. and I was like, you know what? This is going to be my last tournament unless I think I finish like top two. I was like, I'm going to enjoy this. I want one of my best buddies on the bag. Ray lives right here in Scottsdale. I was like, would you want to caddy? And he caddy for Graham Dillette in the Olympics, actually, yep. over in Brazil. So I was like, would you want to caddy? He's like, absolutely. So we go out there, have a nice first round, shoot like one or two under par. But we got to 16 that first day. And it's packed house. Weather's beautiful. I mean, it's loud. I get in there, and I was like, you like nine iron here? And he just looked at me and kind of shook his head and like didn't really talk. And I was like, you all right? He's like, I don't understand how you do this. He goes, I'm so damn nervous right now, and I don't even have to hit a shot. So he was so happy for 16 to get over Thursday. Then we go through there Friday. And once again, place is packed. And I hit the ball on the green. I go mark my ball. And I look over to toss it to Ray to clean it. I'm like, where the hell is he? Oh, I look over and he's in front of the stands of the GA section over there where all the rowdy people are flexing his calves and flirting with the crowd and everything. And I'm like, look at this asshole over here. I was like, hey, Ray, you mind cleaning this ball so we can like maybe try to make birdie on this? Oh, he's like, oh, my bad. He goes, I'm having a great time out here. I was like, yeah, I can tell, bud. Flexing your calves for the crowd. <laughs> that he's, is all the best, though, man. Yeah. yeah, we had so much fun. He's great. That is so good. Yeah, I've only met him a few times, but I, like you said, I mean, almost 1,300 games, if not 1,300 games, cup champ. And he's over there flexing, not the calves, baby. Those are cows because those are pretty big. You know, he's a he's a smaller fella, but, yeah, he's he's definitely those calves. Those are National League calves, you know, Steve. He is a, he is a smaller fella, but he is rather fit. He is, yeah. he has kept it together, even retirement life. It's, it's pretty impressive. But, yeah, those calves are pretty damn big. They 100%. give Phil a run for his money. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> what, like, what is one track? maybe that people wouldn't know obviously other than augusta maybe it's overseas like where's one spot where it's like you, the fate your most favorite place you ever played other than augusta or, you know one of those tracks that just you know you, you just can't wait to get back and play so i was in one because i played well there as far as of course on the pga tour but harbor town where they play the rbc heritage which will be the week after the masters okay. it's just such a unique golf course um, they don't make them like that anymore it's extremely narrow it's crazy claustrophobic with those tall pines and it's just, it's, it's unlike anything else we play in professional golf. So I always just loved getting there. Um, like I said, I played well, but I think the golf course is absolutely incredible. And I wish they designed more like that. As far as overseas, we played the Walker cup at a place called Royal County down in Northern Ireland, which has always been at the top of my list. As far as favorites, I got the chance to go to Australia um, late last year to cover an event for Augusta national and got to play a place called Kingston Heath which is where the President's Cup will be in a couple years ago. And my God, this place is unbelievable. And I caught it on a, like a perfect weather day, too, where it was like 65 and hardly any wind. It blew me away. I think the guys, when, when, when it, the President's Cup gets there and people see it on TV, that's going to be one when you go to, to Melbourne, Australia, you're like, I have to play that place. It was, it was incredible. Yeah, that would be awesome to play golf in Australia. I've been very lucky. This game has take, took me some rather nice places. No, yeah. Steve, when you're playing, when you're playing golf now, like, is it the same for a hockey player? Like, I, you retire from hockey and then you go play beer league, and it's just mm -hmm. not the same. You know, it's not fun anymore. It's just like, is this not the same? Like, do you miss competition or is golf? Do you are you still able to keep it competitive out there? Yeah, so I think you always will miss the competition. That's just what you train for your whole life, and and being in the mix is there's nothing like it. I mean, that feeling of thinking you might puke over every single shot you hit coming down the stretch on a Sunday with a chance to win. It's hard to replicate that. Um, it sucks at the time, but at the end, you're like, damn, that was so much fun. So I think you'll yeah. always miss that. But I don't know. My life now is just there's so much less stress, not having to worry about going out yeah. there and grinding. Like I was one of those guys. I didn't. I was one of the shorter guys on the PGA Tour. I didn't hit it very far. And with the way the game's changed where everybody bombs it, it's just hard for, for guys mm. like me to compete out there. Um, there. I mean, obviously you can still do it, but like I said, my life, I'm not worried about making cuts. Uh, I'm just worried about yeah. trying to be entertaining, not say something stupid and get canceled. Um, yeah. But other than that, man, <laughs> life's so much fun. And, and I, I still love to play. Like I play three or four days a week when I'm home. Uh -huh. uh, I, I keep it ha a handicap now because when I play these PGA tour guys or other professional golfers, like I got to get some strokes from them because my game is definitely not as sharp as it used to be because I never practice, but I still have, so much fun playing right now. It's like, I don't care if I shoot 67 or 77. It's did I win money at the end of the day? That's For sure. Really all that matters. But yeah, and yeah, it's fun. I don't, I rarely get mad anymore when I play bad, but like early on it was, it was tough because you still expect 
to hit those certain shots that you uh-huh. always knew you could. And now it's like like little straightforward chips that I just never practice. Like I suck at them, and it drives me nuts. But then I just laugh it off and say, you know what, <laughs> I, I should never get mad. I don't practice, and yeah, yeah, we ha- we still have a blast. And the guys are nice, and they give me you know anywhere from one aside to two aside, depending on how good they are. And we go out there and we battle. I like it. Still pretty good. Nosti, I wanted to ask you, like, what is one of the sneakier tournaments, maybe off the beaten path cities? You know, is it the John Deere Classic? Is it one of these smaller tournaments where you got a bar lined up? Like, I always remember just like going into Buffalo. Buffalo is a spot that just had it was a sneaky city. Bar time was four in the morning. You kind of have a, a good time at a dive bar. It was low key, good people. Like, is there any of these tournaments that you're going into that are kind of just you know, not circled or household name tournaments, but you're like, wow, I got my spot picked out in this city. I got my bar stool dialed in. You know, it's a, it's a good spot to be. Yeah, there's a few. Um, but you mentioned John Deere Classic, and I think that's one that would surprise you. It's one that I have so much fun at every single year. Uh, we stay at this awesome hotel, and right across the street's a restaurant called Duck City. Phenomenal food. And Chef Jeremy there is a big golf fan, and he does it right. And I have the same table, 7 p.m., every single night and the the people that work there are so much fun uh the the waiters and waitresses are fantastic and then upstairs they have like a cigar bar so after dinner you go up there and they'll let me dj whatever the cocktails get flowing and it is seriously a a little hidden gem on the pga tour but yeah that's one if you ever need me john deer week i'm pretty easy to find Uh, (laughs) the other one i mean i know y'all spent some time in columbus ohio yeah, Memorial Tournament. That I mean, it's a big time tournament, but that is a hell of a week. Um, the crowds are incredible. There's a place called the Bogey Inn right down the street that everybody goes after golf. Um, it, it's what it's a really fun one that you can definitely get in some trouble at. Where is the John Deere? Is that Quad City, Iowa? Quad Cities, yeah. Oh my God, that is unbelievable. I mean, there's a couple of Midwest self-proclaimed beauties over here, North Dakota and Wisconsin. I mean. That's right up my alley, Davenport. brother. You're Duck City. You're on the DJ. Yeah. You're playing the tunes. You're drinking tequila. Like that's that's as good as it gets, as far as I'm concerned. Drinks are like four dollars, probably. You know, that's <laughs> that's right up my alley, man. Davenport, Iowa. Yeah, I always joke. I was like, I just after my bill at Duck City for the week, I just hope I break even with CBS. <laughs> yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Mostly, I wanted to ask you, like, what are some of the better nicknames? on tour i mean Mm. as hockey guys big nickname guys over here you know my nickname is swish we got ozzo like tommy fleetwood's one name i kind of pops in my head i call him tommy fleet butter but i think his nickname on tour is fairway jesus because that guy he don't miss a fairway is there any other like just low-key names or nicknames that the folks wouldn't really know about or is it kind of just uh pretty stock i would say most of the best nicknames are with caddies the caddies have great nicknames um you know, rest in peace. There was this guy, Caddy, out there forever. Actually played and won on the PGA Tour, um, but his name was Last Call Lance uh, because obviously you can figure it out. I mean, he was he, la- he, he got Last <laughs> oh, Call yeah, every, yeah. every single time. He was a legend. Though. His name was Lance Timbrook. Uh, I actually was paired with his boss, Jesper Parnovic, and very early on in my career and got to know him. But Last Call Lance was always one of my favorite. We actually have a new one now that we're trying to get going and. I actually, Aaron Rodgers played with him at the AT&T Pebble Beach this year, and I told Aaron to start calling him this, and that kind of gained some traction. But Bo Hostler and, God, I just, Austin Ekro. Okay, mm-hmm. they're both members up here at Wisprock. Austin won on tour early this year, but they're both sponsored by Michael Coors. So, obviously, it says mm-hmm. Coors on their shirt. Well, mm-hmm. Austin's the little skinny guy. Bo's a little bigger guy. So, we got Austin we call Coors Light, and we call Bo Banquet. Banquet bowl. Yes. Banquet. yes. So we're working on banquet. That's going good. A little bit. And Bo actually likes it. And he's like, dude, you told Aaron Rodgers to call me banquet. He did it all week. It was amazing. I'm like, well, damn it. I was really hoping you wouldn't like it. Uh, but but he did it. But yeah, banquet's banquet's a good one we're trying to get to stick right now. I like that. I think Bo Hosser might even actually live in the same building as me. But yeah, banquet bowl. That's a nice name. But I'll speaking of the What's greatest, that? the greatest out on the PGA tour, and it's not even close, but he embraces it now. And I have made this – I did not come up with it. I will not take credit for that. But I did take it to the golf world and to television. Yep. But it's Charlie Hoffman, and we call him the Seagull because he just flies around and shits on everyone. Because <laughs> it is. And now everyone in the gallery yells it. Every time I see him, like, sitting down the fairways, I do the bird. Yeah. Bird yeah. Wings. yeah. Um, he, he just had his foundation event a couple months ago, and they had these socks with seagulls all over it. So now he, he loves the nickname, which sucks. Yeah. I was hoping he, he wouldn't like it, but it's a, it's one of my favorites. 
That's awesome. And, and speaking of loopers, Nostia, we were talking a little bit pre-show, and I was telling you how I caddy for my brother. I was on the bag for Nick Schmaltz this year at the Madison City Open, just one of the first tournaments you've ever played. You play with him. He's a pretty good stick. Uh, the four days he was under par. But Nosti, I got to tell you, man, I had everything dialed in in the caddy bib. I mean, I had cigarettes, right, <laughs> just in case you need a rally dart. I had the red man chew. Well, fellas, sometimes you got to chew on one. Condoms. Sometimes you got to play it safe. I had the groove cleaner, three sets of tees. So what I'm saying is, how do we get Nick Schmaltz over to the tournament in Tahoe? And I give the people what they really need is the caddy over here over in Swish because I'm dialed in, man. I got everything. How does Nicky get a chance at that? Does he got to get on a different team than the Desert Dogs? Does he got to go win a cup? Like, how do we get him in that tournament? Because I think he can play. That's a great question. Um, I have no idea. Last year was actually my first year ever to that tournament because normally my schedule doesn't work out. And damn, that is, you got to go. It is so much fun. Yeah. I actually ended up at caddying for a hockey player. We were there to do this MC deal for Corbell with our podcast. And I met Alex Kalorn several years ago, became friends with him. And he was there and he's like, I got a couple of buddies coming out to help me caddy. They don't really know what they're doing. Would you want to do it? And I'm like, sure. I mean, I, I, it's, it's July. I have no interest in going back to Scottsdale. It's 110 degrees. I'll stay up here in Tahoe and have some fun. And, man, we had the best time. I made sure the bag was loaded, little Tito's Gatorade, keep yep. you hydrated and little a little Gatorade. relaxed. And then the little airplane fireball bottles in case it's a little panic situation and we need to really relax. But he went out there, played <laughs> great the first day, playing alongside TJ Oshie. Went out there. Yep. He was in third place after the first day. He's in the final group on Saturday with Steph Curry and, and Pavs, Pavelski. Yep. And, yeah. and Killer had never played a golf tournament before. And this it's – there's 10,000 people down the first hole. Like, it's lined five, six deep. Oh, yeah. and, and my man, I, I didn't know if he was going to be able to talk that day. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a great learning experience. And Steph ended up making a hole-in-one on eight, which was unbelievable. But one of the most fun weeks I've ever had. And I hope Killer gets back in again because we said we're going to run it back. But you've got to go if you ever get a chance. 100%. It looks like just an absolute party. Like you said, that that par three is unbelievable. You get the basketball shot. But yeah. it be like for people that have never played in an environment like that, like Killer going into that, even TJ Oshie, he's done a few tournaments now. I've even talked to him about it, just like how nervous he was the first time. Like you don't want to hosel one and just kill somebody. Like that's got to be such a different animal playing inside the ropes like that. Yeah, the first day, like there's a few people following. Yeah, but right. it was nothing. Like when we got to that first tee, last group, first hole and it's just lined and it and you have to hit like a three or four iron off this first hole so it's not like you're sending driver down there but these people i i don't know if they just think they're like as good as professional golfers or what but they stand in the dumbest places i'm like <laughs> one of y'all is just gonna take one to the dome this is just, i don't understand why you were standing there like this is not what these guys do for a living and um yeah there's definitely a lot of nerves going on it's cool to talk to the to the guys and just get their like thoughts on it because they're not used to it. I remember Jason Kidd here. Yeah. I mean, shot free throws, made shots in front of the, I mean, from the whole world, won an NBA championship. And the first time he stepped foot on 16 here at Phoenix, he's like, dude, I, I just, I, I can't do this. I have no idea. how. I'm like, you've shot in a free throw in front of this many people. He's like, man, it's not even close to the same. It, it really yeah. isn't because it's just some of what that little that little sweet spot on a wrench that you have to hit. Mm. Even like it doesn't even compare to hockey because at least hockey you got your boys out there with you. You know you got mm. the boys on the bench, you got the guys you know five or six on the ice. It's just nothing compares to it. But one spot we do a golf trip every year, Nosty, and it's we change up the cities. We've done Nashville, we've done Vegas. Some years we don't even bring our golf sticks. We're just like we're just going on a bender. It's all of our North Dakota buddies. There's probably like eight or nine guys still playing in the NHL. Probably one or two playing overseas, and then a few in the minors, and then guys that are done playing like me and Gage. But if you're sending the boys one spot, and probably parting might still be the number one objective. But if we want to get in some good golf, we did Charleston, South Carolina last year. It was pretty decent. Where's like one spot? Or one place that you would send the fellas is abandoned dunes. Is it, you know, Pine Valley or, or Pine Valley? Like, where are you where are you sending the fellas? So this is the easiest question you've asked me, and I, I give this answer to everyone. If, I mean, if I have one day left to play golf in my life, I'm going here because now abandoned dunes, all those places, they're great. I have no interest in playing 36 holes. Like I want to, I want to mm -hmm. go have a great time at night. You know, dinner out, have a few, not get up crazy early play 18 holes, have a few, and do it all back. It's Shadow Creek in Las Vegas. I mean, it's just – it's heaven for me. I was just out there 
just spent three days there playing golf and I was exhausted come the end because there wasn't much sleep involved. But for me, I got to have something to do after golf. And definitely, like I, I've said it, if I have one round of golf left to play in my life, I'm, I'm going to Shadow Creek. Between the golf course is great, the staff is even better, and just the experience. It's, you, you cannot have more fun. So yeah. we're headed back to Vegas. Looks like we're going back to Nevada, folks. Pack your shit. And Twist my it. arm. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like we're heading back to Nevada, fellas. No, Steve, before we let you go, uh, and we got to tee it up here soon, but you probably were giving me about one shot a hole in terms of, because I carry two big sticks in my bag. I call it the double dog system. Yes, I can make a putt from Tucson, but I just can't hit a drive, brother. I, I got good hands. I just, off the box, it's just not perfect. But before we get to the Dirty Dog Saloon, I wanted to ask you, one sleeper pick going into the Masters. We talked about Scotty Scheffler. We talked about some of the live guys. But what's like one guy that you would put some maybe a little bit of act, action on and sprinkle in as a guy who would have pretty good odds, but you know maybe is a little bit of a sleeper going into this week at Augusta? I don't think he's a sleeper, but I do like the odds. I mean, depending on obviously where you look, 25 to 30-ish to one range. He's probably like the sixth or seventh betting favorite, which is definitely not a sleeper. We can go a little more down the list if you want for that. But – I have just thought for five years he is going to win around Augusta National at some point. His golf course is tailor-made for it. I continue. I think he continues to get better, even though he hasn't won as much lately as as we all think he should. But Xander Schauffele, man, he is mm -hmm. just a badass. Um, he's hitting it so far right now. I'm doing some work with this guy named Chris Como. I, I get I get to walk with him a lot out there. I, his game just blows me away every time. He's a great putter. Uh, he's got a really good record for not winning at Augusta National. I just think Xander mm -hmm. Schauffele is going to get it done at some point. Does that do anything to his men mentality coming into these tournaments, just not closing at the players this year? Like, is that like a – or does he just move past that? I mean, I, I suppose it just depends on the player. You know, I know it eats at him because he wants to close, obviously more than the media wants him to or anything like that, so then he can stop answering those questions. There's a lot of people that say, you know, he can't get it done in those big events. He was right there at TPC Sawgrass, the players. I mean, Scotty shot 64. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, he, he probably let that one get away a little bit. But, man, he's, he's a big-time player. He's 30 mm -hmm. years old. Uh, I just – I think once he gets one big one, I expect it to turn into, you know, multiple. I'm not saying he's going to yeah. win 10 majors or anything like that. But I just – there's something about Augusta National and the way he plays golf that I just think – really sets up well and i would be shocked if before his career is over he doesn't put on the green jacket my last question for you nosti is you got any just good tiger stories whether it was coming up on the tour maybe even just working now with cbs you know getting to maybe know him a little bit better like what's one good eldrick story you have for the people yeah obviously i've gotten to know him a lot more over the last few years i actually got to walk with him for the first time at L la the year before last and uh, three of the four days, and he was great. Um, actually chatted some going down the fairways, and then I got to catch up with him during the pro -Am. But my first year as a pro was at the Arnold Palmer Invitational, and I got a spot as being the reigning U.S. Amateur Champion. I was in the group behind him with Dustin Johnson and Jason Day on Thursday, and he lived down at Isleworth at the time. He would warm up at his house, on the range there and then drive 10 minutes over to Bay Hill, basically walk onto the putting green, hit some putts and then go to the tee. So we all, I knew I, we were like a group or two behind him. So I was going to see him, but I walk out of the, the locker room at, at Bay Hill, turn right to go to the putting green. It's kind of like a 20, 30 yard like kind of hallway that's covered and all the media people were kind of lined up against the wall there. And I come out of the door and you hear these metal spikes on the concrete, just click, 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 click. And I turn around and it's Tiger. And I jumped up against the wall with the media people and let him walk by because I was just absolutely fucking terrified. I was like, <laughs> Holy shit, there he is. I mean, it, and it, yeah. and I just let him go by. And it was it was so cool, man. It's he's just he's just so different um, when he's mm -hmm. at a tournament. There is just a different feel and it makes it so much better. I remember the one year he played Tampa, which he hadn't played in forever. He finished second at it. But they like had to add three extra entrances for all the people that were coming. And. I tell the story all the time. Roy McIlroy was the number one player in the world at the time. He was on the range. And Tiger, uh, Tiger was on the range first. The place was packed. There were thousands of people, and this range is small. And they were just packed deep as all could be, just trying to see Tiger hit some range balls. He leaves. 
here comes the world number one, Rory McIlroy, and there might have been 10 people on the range watching him hit balls. And I was like, <laughs> that just shows you how different this guy is. Yeah. That's all it's not even close to the same. No, it's it's so cool, man. I hope somehow, some way, we can see him play, you know, five, six tournaments, at least all the majors this year, mm-hmm. and and just somehow get in the mix. I mean, if he's going to get in the mix, it's probably going to be at Augusta just because of the knowledge he has of that place. But, man, when he's there, it just, it just feels so much bigger, and, and I love it, man. He's the best, man. I mean, uh, he's he's the goat. He's obviously like this. Even your age, no Steve, Even just y- the younger generation. I mean, that's that's who we grew up watching, and that's who we just grew up idolizing. I mean, whether he was uh, you know wheeling a chick at Perkins or he's winning majors, like this is my guy. You know, this is the guy that I love. He's the, he's the goat. It's Eldrick Woods, baby. Every time. Yeah, he is. He is special. I remember like, this year at Riviera, I was out walking the pro am um, just to, to because they didn't allow the gallery out there on Wednesday and. Um, I just wanted to see, see how his game looked. And we get to the fourth hole, this par three. And I was kind of just like looking in his bag and we were just chatting back and forth. And he's like, yeah, I had to go to this like kind of cheater three iron. I just can't, I just can't hit it as high as I used to. I don't have the speed I used to. And I'm like, okay, whatever. We pulls out four irons, just normal blade one. and hits this thing to the moon. And it comes down just so beautifully. It goes to like four feet. And I was like, oh, really? Just can't quite hoist it like you used to, huh? <laughs> I mean, that's just... It, it's so different, man. He is, he's awesome. He's, he's guess, jacked he's, now too. He's huge. Yeah, his, his upper body is just oh. massive. So I, it's cool, man. I'm excited. I hope he can just at least, you know, I, I think he'll make the cut at Augusta just because of, like I said, how well he knows the place. I don't know if he can get in contention. Just tournament golf is so much different than being at home with your boys playing and yeah. getting ready. Uh, but if he could somehow just get in that mix, the buzz that would be around that place, man, it'd be magical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to be unbelievable, and we'll obviously be listening to you on the call, Nosty. And you know, it's you're one of the best in the game. I love listening to you, just the insight you have on the game, the way you articulate things. And we just want to thank you for coming on and stopping by live in five, the Masters adjust- edition with you. And uh, look forward to watching that in Augusta and seeing you out there, baby. So thanks again for stopping by. We appreciate it. You got yeah, it. Thanks, thanks for having awesome. me on, guys. Awesome. Thanks again. He just takes the tractor another round.